skeptics say your campaign to divest is, is a flea on the tail of an elephant, a nuisance to the fossil fuel industry, but no real threat. How do you respond to that? Frankly, four years ago, I was incredibly pessimistic that we could have any impact on this climate change issue. In 2009, the governments of the world failed to come to any kind of meaningful agreement in the, at the Copenhagen meeting. In 2010, climate legislation failed in the U.S. Senate. And into that vacuum stepped a student movement. And they did take a play from the anti-apartheid playbook. And they said, we're putting the focus right on the industry itself. And because the industry is driving the problem, it is funding denial of the problem, it is refusing to advance safe and clean alternatives, and it's shutting down the policy process with campaign contributions and lobbying. And so by putting the target on the fossil fuel industry, the goal is not to have an immediate economic impact on the fossil fuel industry, but to isolate it as a moral pariah, like apartheid, like tobacco. Remember in South Africa days, they said, look, at divestment doesn't make any sense. And then Desmond Tutu said, we don't want our chains made more comfortable. We need to have people pull out to help with the economic transition of that society. I think divestment from fossil fuels is the same. Their vision of what the planet looks like and the idea of being able to drill and burn all the fossil fuels that they have on their balance sheets today is just something that civilization cannot survive. Okay. Now investors are realizing this. This is something that civilization cannot survive. And their approach to this is very interesting and, in fact, quite instructive because what they're saying, in effect, is that, Harvard, you better figure this one out and get on the right side of it. Bill puts it to them as a question, too. Investments. But take Harvard. Mm -hmm. It's the big fish in the pond, $32 mm -hmm. billion dollars in endowment. The president of Harvard says that what you two want, she didn't call you by name, but <laughs> we can imagine who she had in mind, is unwarranted and unwise, that it would come at a substantial economic cost to the university. Then there's Bowdoin College, small college in Maine, with a billion dollar endowment. And the chief of Bowdoin's uh, billion dollar endowment says divesting would have cost the college $100 million over the last decade. And I suspect if she were sitting here, she would say to you, Tom Van Dyke, wouldn't that be fiducially irresponsible on my part? I would say that's bad math. I would say you don't have creative enough people okay. running your money for you if that's the case. <laughs> Here's an investment officer saying, okay, I would say that's bad math. You don't have creative enough people running your investments for you. So, Harvard, maybe you ought to check it out. This is being said within the financial community to institutions that hold investments like Harvard in the fossil fuel area. Yes. What is a problem is you have these different hedge funds that they're involved in that have particular funds that they can't control what's actually held in that. And so they're worried they'll have to fire that particular hedge fund. And but they don't like to do that, and they don't particularly want to do, if they're and they producing good returns. But if enough endowments get together and say, hey, why don't you set up a sleeve that is fossil fuel free and you can short the coal companies and, you know, and go long the solar companies and you, can, and you can hedge that if you want. But you just can't be buying the top 200 companies. My guess is, is given the size of that market, that those hedge funds will say, sure, we'll set up a sleeve for you guys. You know, we'll humor you. And if they put pressure on their managers to do that, my guess is the managers will do that. Right now, they're not willing to take that next step and pressure those managers. All they need to do is ask. I would also argue that looking back over the past 10 years, um, we've seen dramatic changes in the financial markets. And I think it's problematic to try and look at the past 10 years and predict the future. And if you look at the case studies of institutions like my foundation and other foundations that we're partnering with that have in fact divested from fossil fuels, invested in climate solutions, renewables and clean tech, we've done very well in the market in the near term, short term. Um, and we're confident when you look at the projections for renewables and you look at 
the risks, the financial risks of staying invested in fossil fuels over the long term, I feel like we are making the right bet. We are the ones investing in the future and we'll do well. And, I, and, and have done well. And I do think coal is a precursor to that. I mean, if you look at what coal's done for the last four or five years, coal has dropped dramatically. It's, and it's a very poor performing In the market? Asset. In the market. Mm -hmm. Price shares too? Oh yeah, it's been crushed. And we think that oil could be, that could be a precursor to what might happen to oil in the next decade or so. So it's really about looking at the fiduciary risk and the valuation, because if these oil companies don't responsibly deal with that, there's going to be a risk there associated with owning but, those companies. But let me shift gears a little bit, because you raise this issue of fiduciary duty. And I would argue that any institution that receives charitable tax status because they serve the public good has to look at whether their investments are in fact serving the public good. And they're... Whoa. Now, that's a whole new argument. Harvard receives the tax status because it's serving the public good. Are its investments serving the public good? This is a larger question as to whether Harvard should, in a sense, be benefiting from the tax-free status if it's not acting in the public good. She makes the case very strongly could not be a arguably a more stark case about the role of the fossil fuel industry in driving climate change and if you have a mission to protect the public good climate change will impact that dramatically whether your focus is education whether your focus is the environment whether your focus is human rights climate change will impact your mission as a as a charitable institution and so I think as a fiduciary matter to protect your mission, you should be looking at your investments in fossil fuels. And when you couple that with the financial risks associated with staying in fossil fuels over the long term, because as a fiduciary, you're to be looking at the long term viability of your investments, I think the ethical and the financial align in a pretty powerful way. But I've heard. Okay. The ethical and the financial are aligned as a powerful logic to get out of fossil fuels now. Now, it's not going to be easy, and Jim Anderson has pointed this out as a faculty member in his faculty statement. Basically, this we're entangled with fossil fuels in a way that can't be engineered just tomorrow or just as a matter of opinion uh, very quickly, but it means that we have to start using all our cleverness and our intention uh, to move that in the right direction. So the question really becomes very quickly, you know, what is warranted and who is wise? When the president of Harvard used the phrase that divesting from fossil fuels is neither warranted or wise, she's inviting us to investigate what is warranted, who is wise in reference to the coming changes in the climate. This is why the students are responding quite vociferously on the national scale with a letter to the nation. Harvard President Drew Faust is still wrong. It's why the faculty has called for divestment. And it's why there's going to be a set of things on April 30th a whole series of events. Come out for it if you can in front of Massachusetts Hall at 10 a.m. Keep in touch on air and online as we cover these things of fossil fuel divestment and the future it holds. Thank you very much. See you next week.